What's up, guys? Coach Steve here, and welcome back to another episode of the Challenge Podcast. And in today's episode, I'm joined with the brand new Maxine's Challenge Coach. We've got Coach Nick joining us today. Nick, welcome to the Challenge Podcast. Hi, Coach Steve. How are you? I'm I'm really well. How are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. Very good. Look, I'm excited to introduce you to our challenge community. But I guess the first question I have, Nick, is how do you pronounce your name? Oh, um, the whole lot of it. Um, yes, Nic- Nicoletta Cepellini. Nicoletta yeah, want- Cepellini. Yeah, if you want to do that, <laughs> or if you just if you just go Nick Chep. <laughs> Nick Chep. I feel like I just That's want easy. to. I want to use yeah. my hand to say your name, or maybe know, two hands. Like, yeah, it's very Nicoletta. important. Nicoletta Cepellini. You know, that's that's the way to do it. You know, it's very, very um long. <laughs> very long. So um, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that you are Italian. Yes. Yes. So um, my my dad is Italian. Um, my husband is not. So his his name is actually Smith. But um, so my kids are Smith, but I'm I'm Cepellini. So um, yeah, Italian background. So uh, very passionate, very passionate. So that's you know a lot of passion goes into everything um, that's Italian. So that's me. I love that. Yeah. Look, Nick, um, would you like to start us off by um, telling us a little bit about yourself? So maybe telling us, um, you know, who is Nick? Where are you from? And and what do you do? Those types of things. Okay, so I am from Melbourne. Um, I uh, have really live and breathe fitness now. Um, it's been my life for probably the last nearly 13 years. So my eldest daughter is 13 years old. Um, even prior to, to giving birth, I um, was very act, a very active person. But after during the birth process, I really got into Pilates. And then I realized that I was quite competitive because on that reformer bed, I had to be the best on the reformer and, um, you know, even the best pregnant person, you know, doing the most stuff. So it was like, oh, hang on a minute. I I hadn't really looked into that at school. So I wasn't very sporty or anything. Uh, I sort of used my academic side and got lots of uni qualifications and stuff. And then after the girls were born, I sort of started going to the gym a little bit, doing um, group fitness classes, really getting involved in that, doing um, some spin classes and then uh, like producing some really good output in the spin. So the instructor was like, oh, you're a bit, you're good at this. I'm like, well, I'm good at something in the gym. What? So um, then, you know, because a lot of people don't really want to teach cycle because it's really hard on your body. So I just decided to teach every class that I could day night in between have um you know the kids being little and then suddenly it became a thing so um I became good at teaching cycle it became my absolute job all the time so I was just back to back you know even up to about 20 classes a week I don't know how I did that but um really got out there met the whole of Melbourne you know made it my mission to just be the best that I could be and um in the meantime decided to you know get all my qualifications in um fitness you know personal training as well and um just start a whole like new career for myself yeah so um and in the meantime I was also doing yeah the, the triathlons and and um decided to do the big iron man when it was the last time it was in melbourne so that was really cool um it consisted of like a a, a run to st kilda from frankston so if anyone's familiar with that area it's a long way to run you know it's a marathon at the end of everything else so that was a challenge that I was able to complete, which is always one of my, I think I look back and think that was something that really transformed me as well. Because if I ever talk to people about resilience, it's something that I can draw on and go, how did I get through that particular thing? And how does that now drive me as a person? So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. You've kind of uh, dumped a, a lot about you. <laughs> in, uh, I know. Let's, let's, uh, let's break it let's down unpack. a little bit. Yeah. Let's unpack. <laughs> let's unpack. So you, I guess, were first introduced to fitness through Pilates, right? Yeah. Very initially. So that, yeah, that's like, like you teach, you know, you're, you're a Pilates person, so you'll know the benefits of Pilates and it's quite addictive. It's, it's really um, just that movement and it's actually harder than you think which is fantastic like it's it's quite challenging yeah Yeah. so you you didn't really come from a a sporty or fitness background until you were pregnant Um, and started doing um 
Pilates? Yeah, no, not really because um, my, my big driver was for me, what I wanted to do was be able to um, really be like have a really active birth for mm-hmm. both my children. So I knew that to do that for me, I had to put in a lot of work to get my body ready. So mm-hmm. I did a lot of workshopping and a lot of um, way, you know, a lot of connection with my body, uh, with movement, with, um, you know, endurance type stuff that it takes for that type of a birth. And and I was fortunate enough to be able to, to do that twice. And um, then initially I thought, okay, what do I want to do? I want to help women give birth but that that was a little bit much for me when I got into that area and I and that's how I then sort of moved on to to getting into fitness because fitness was something really not as risky and a bit more a bit more positive um and like you can immediately impact people so that's I think that's why fitness resonated with me and also because my um my family, my, my dad and brother are paramedics and things. It was always, they were the body people and my mum and I were sort of the brainy ones, you know, the academic ones. So I didn't really get a chance when I was younger to pursue too many like sporty things. It was more about just getting all the info in, in my brain. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about what you did, I guess, before. So you keep kind of referring to university and academics yeah. and stuff. Like what's, what kind of background are we talking about here? So uh, creative writing was initially where I I kind of found myself going to. And um, then I ended up doing um, visual culture and communications. And um, I did a big, I did my honours thesis on on gender in Australia and identity in Australian film and and, um, what that meant. And then I sort of led on to doing creative writing and, and, um, yeah, ended up kind of, I guess that's why I love to write things on social media and, and that's how I see that's what the purpose of that was to kind of um, to learn in a formal sense how to structure something and also just grammar and stuff, which is really, it's actually really helpful in the real world to be able to structure something nicely. So um, I find that that works now for my business and for other things that I do. So I can, I can put together something quite quickly. So now I look back and think that's why I did that. Um, and also to be able to relate to lots of different people because I've read widely and I love reading and I love writing. So therefore in my classes or in things that I'll do, I like to reference different cultural things as well. So just to keep people entertained, different music, you know, it just, it doesn't have to just be about the body. It can be about the mind as well and just make things a bit like a bit of fun as well. It doesn't just have to be one facet. Yeah. I think that's what keeps people interested. I actually really like, I think that's really cool because, you know, when we consider fitness and health, uh, most people often, you know, have a certain image that they think of, like, you know, the, the meat head in the gym or the cardio yeah. bunny on the exercise or like the, yeah. you know, the, their certain image of what it is. And when mm-hmm. we think of the fitness coach, you know, we, we're often like, um, you know, tunnel, put in a, in a pigeon box, maybe like tunnel vision of, you know, this is what this person does. But yeah. I think we often miss like all the skills before we became that and how that kind of shaped who we are now. Um, Mm. And, you know, I really, I'm really interested in, you know, all these previous studies you did such as writing Mm. and gender studies and maybe cultural Mm. studies and visual communication and all these Mm. things. I wonder what all these little skills you picked up over time and how you, you know, so, uh, unconsciously apply that now. Like, have you thought yeah. about some of these things that you might have picked up? And you kind of said it already where, you know, maybe different cultural aspects and interacting mm. with people. Have you thought mm. about how, like, all these little skills you picked up through your academic career have unconsciously translated to your ability to motivate people, your ability to create connections in class and, you know, motiv- uh, I guess around that personal yeah. touch with people like can you speak a little bit about that about some things that you might have sure. learned and picked up yeah definitely look I think I think that every single thing that I've ever done has led me to every moment of every class or every interaction with every client because it's sort of this this build up of history that if I didn't have that just say I started when I was straight out of school doing fitness which is great as well but I, I would not have this sort of foundation that makes me who I am. So it just means that I'm able to just go a little bit broader and kind of, you know, I guess when I'm interacting with someone for the first time or with the class or with people that I've known for a long time, I I can kind of 
pinpoint where they might be coming from, what kind of a learner they might be, what kind of cues they might need, how they might need to feel to be motivated because not everybody is the same. Not everybody wants to be screamed at and not everybody wants the gentle approach either, but there has to be some sort of a middle ground, but there also has to be layers upon that. So I, the only way that I know that I've learned how to do all of this is from the background that I have. And also other good thing, one good thing that came out of all this university stuff is being able to research really quickly. So like if you said to me, I need you to look up, this, this is happening now. I could pretty quickly find, you know, an article on it and who, who wrote it and whether it's a, a decent source and that kind of thing. So, like, for evidence-based stuff, it, that's um, really helpful, I find. Um, just that, that quick research ability, which I, I'm hoping that the next generations to come, I'm trying to teach my kids as well, just to, to be able to, to read and research and um, and be able to pick up things quickly and look for things and look a bit deeper. And um, that, that translates so well to fitness as well, because one size does not fit all. And, um, you know, anyone that sort of like, just like academics, you know, you have to, you have to come at it with different approaches. You might have a belief, but you certainly need to figure out how everything fits into that. Yeah. 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 I think you haven't really thought about it, but um, now that I have, that's the answer. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I often reflect um, from my previous experiences and you know other avenues outside of fitness and how they um, kind of direct me when I'm creating programs, coaching people, mm-hmm. thinking about the body, coaching myself, mm-hmm. these types of things. Um, mm-hmm. And often we don't think about it, but we are a combination of all of our previous experiences. And that could be, mm-hmm. you know, all the, the friends you've made in the past, maybe your personal experiences with weight loss, family, with Mm. competitions, with sport, and they kind of interplay with our ability to coach because at the end of the day, you know, we're coaching people and sure it Mm. helps that you and I are uh, more trained in things and we understand the human body and we understand Mm. program design and nutrition and all these things. That's just, you know, they're easy things. They're things we can learn. And especially what you said, we're in the information age. If anything, we're Mm. closer to the disinformation age because there's so much information at our fingertips. We kind of need that skill to be able to um, critically critically analyze stuff and maybe put our own biases aside or our own opinions aside and go, okay, well, what's the research saying? What's the evidence Mm. saying? Balance that out with what our anecdotal experience works and then you know, mm. expectations, all these other things in between. Um, yeah. But you, you really, really nailed it there. But look, talking about mm. experiences, you know, you've kind of mentioned children. Um, what mm. was it like as you kind of transitioned both into fitness and then into motherhood? Like that would have been a very big change in your identity. Like what was that like, you know, going and doing more group fitness classes as well as having newborns? Can you speak a little yeah. bit about that? Well, at the time, gyms were they were still having creches like Mm -hmm. a lot of that's being cut out now with the new sort of gym models where the 24 7 get people in get out but uh, there's still quite a few gyms that have got creches which is wonderful but I was lucky I had a gym just around the corner from me that had wonderful creche Um, the girls were able to go in there together because some creches used to separate the kids and that was that was that wasn't I didn't feel right doing that so um, I had that lined up for me I had the the right kind of support which you need to, whenever you're embarking on anything, how are you going to get anywhere unless you've got a bit of a support network? It doesn't even have to be necessarily the close family because say my husband was at work, so he had to work. Um, you know, I had my mum, she was great. She is great and my dad, but they they live suburbs away. So to be able to have that crash, that was really good. And also to be able to say to myself, it's okay. It's okay that it's, it's an hour and a bit. Um, they're with me. The rest of the time, I need this so then I can be happy and be a good mum. So I kind of cottoned onto that pretty quickly. I cottoned onto the physical exercise thing for me is something that makes me feel better. And that's why I still do my spin at 5.45 with the people in in my shed now, Um, you know, that kind of a thing and those classes because without it, even though we're meant to rest and everything, but I just know mentally the endorphins and other things help me. So um, that was a good way to transition into being a mum because at first I just went, because I'd done all the birth stuff and I thought like, oh, yeah, I'm good for me. Yeah, you know. But then when they're out, it's like, oh, 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 what happens now? So um, 
I did go through just loss of identity because I'd been working. I, I'd also worked in advertising because when you do writing, you pretty much end up working in advertising. So it was quite fast paced. I would go at the time to Sydney a lot. I would have a company credit card. We would have work drinks. It was crazy. And suddenly I was at home in um, my house in Burwood with my daughter going, what do I do? I didn't even really want to go, didn't want to go to mother's groups or anything. Um, I wish like, I, I wish more people spoke about this because a lot of people like just go, oh, it's the best thing ever. But for me, my first one, Lucia, like at first I just, I was just a bit lost. So um, when I found the gym, I found a community. I found other women that were like-minded. They wanted to lift weights or they wanted to do a class, like a spin class. And then we might, we, we all had kids, so we might take them to have a coffee. And it was like, oh my gosh, we don't have to just talk about nappies. We can talk about um everything how was that spin class what was going on and then when I got to be the instructor that was so much fun because it was like suddenly I was teaching all my friends at first so Mm. and it was I felt so empowered and then I thought this is this is where I'm meant to be and now I always think um about how in how much the gym and that kind of environment is good for people's mental health even when we were locked down you know how there was a big push you know gyms are good for mental health well I can absolutely attest to that because without that becoming I guess my new identity in a way I don't know what I would do like I'm just looking at this photo now which has got um my kids giving me a cuddle after one of my triathlons and it's just funny because I hadn't looked at it for a while but see they they kind of just got used to me being that that mum that would just be doing that so they're like their little pink coats they were on the the beach with me all the time and so that's how they kind of grew up so now they're like oh what are you doing now what are you doing now mum But um, yeah, so that became my identity and and I was lucky enough to have a supportive family. My husband would take them to the beach, the poor guy, because it's actually really boring, I (laughs) realised. And also to try and get them to not run on the road while the bikes are going past and stuff and to to chill because you only go past it like once every hour or something. But um, So that just became what I could do. And then now that I can actually get paid to do this, I still pinch myself every day because it's like, Mm. wait a minute, this is actually, um, I still don't feel like it's work. Mm-hmm. Like even if even if we had, just say there was something that was going on at midnight, I would be like, yeah, yeah, no worries because it's fun to me mm-hmm. still, which is strange after 13 years. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's actually fun. Could, mm. you, could you tell us a little bit what, about what it's like when you uh, transition into fitness? And yeah. what I mean by that is, you know, you kind of say that you were um, – you know, going to group fitness classes and you were getting mm. a, a, you're going there for the community, you were mm. um, getting fitter yourself and you were doing well, as in, you know, you said that your instructor was yeah. say that you were like quite uh, active in the group and stuff. What was it yeah. like when you kind of went from that position of, you know, I am the person in the class to now being like the leader of the class? Like, was it an yeah. easy transition or did you have any challenges as you went from the uh, you know, fit person to now the personal trainer or the the participant to now like the leader of the group. Can you can you speak about that? Well, um, I was there were there were parts of me that were super confident because I've always been a bit of a performer. So um, even at school, I used to love to do singing and I would like want to be the lead and I'd, I'd really, you know, want to be the top of that. So, and I got to play my music in the class. So like that just became like, it was a giant performance. Mm-hmm. So um in a way for maybe about three or four or five years of teaching, I, I was a character, you know, it's been, it's only been recently that I've kind of revealed who I really am. Mm-hmm. But so I just created a character, but I'll tell you what I used to do. I used to walk into class really early and put my shoes on the bike because I didn't want to spend ages trying to clip in and make it look like I was weird. <laughs> so I would do all sorts of stuff like that. And I'd have like OCD about setting up the mic and, and the stereo and, and other stuff. But, um, other than that, look, everybody around me was really supportive. So um, they they all just, they liked the classes. So they, they kind of became um, very addicted to it. So I, I was kind of lucky in that way um, that I started off like that. But then I, I set myself challenges and I still do. It's like I need to be able to go out there to a full room of people I don't know and still mm-hmm. check if I've got it, like if I can do it still. So I'm constantly doing that. But also in the meantime, while I was teaching that, I also um, had a a coach that kind of mentored me in the weights area. And he would say, um, you know, you can do, you can do both. You can do your triathlons and your weights, but 
when I started to say to him, look, I want to squat a hundred kilos, this was after the Ironman. He was like, Mm -hmm. okay, so if you want to do that, you might have to, there might have to be a little bit of give and take with all your endurance stuff. And Mm -hmm. that's when I started to ease into the powerlifting. So, but I always had, I always seemed to have people behind me that were very confident in my abilities and that really helped me because without that, I don't really know how I would have felt. And I've still got that around me. I've still mm-hmm. got like, I've surrounded myself with, with people that really believe in what I can do and um, how I make them feel, but also like even coaches and things that, that are like, now if you stick with this, you'll go far. So, you know, it's always good to have people in your corner, mm-hmm. you know, no matter how high up you get, you, you've got to have your support network. Yeah. So I guess, um, and maybe another little philosophical question, when you are in those, um, you know, goal orientated pursuits, such as doing, I doing an Ironman and, um, you know, we, we can touch on maybe a bit of powerlifting, maybe a bit of bodybuilding and these other mm. like, you know, goal driven events. Mm. Do you, um, find that you are leaning onto this support network or do you find that you are pepping yourself up to kind of do it for them? Like, for example, like a coach, uh, you know, you don't want to give up because you don't want to upset your coach, right? You don't want to, you don't want to stop the triathlon or don't want to not squat that hundred kilos because you almost want to do it for them. So do you find that you are, you know, getting energy off of your support network or are you building yourself up so that you could do it for them? Like, have you thought about that before? Um, oh, look, the thing is at the end of the day, um, it's, it's down to me. So I am actually a very, it's, even though I've said about my support network, I'm a very lone wolf. So mm-hmm. like I will, if I want to do something it, at the, like millions of, someone can say you can do it, you can do it, but unless I believe that I can do it or unless I really want to do it, I ain't going to do it. Mm-hmm. Like it's just say like when I used to power lift and, and it would, my Achilles heel was, was around about like the 150 kilos. It's like, mm-hmm. I could do the 140 every day for a deadlift, mm-hmm. but um, if I was 150, I would go. Mm. And if I could not see it done, it wouldn't matter about the pats on the back, the slaps, you can do it. Yeah. That, that actually annoyed me at that point. Like when you get to that pointy pointy level where you, you're going to have to give everything and it's going to have to come from like a really like, a place that it's hard to even visit that has to be that at the like the very end of it all it has to be you Mm -hmm. that does it and and you you almost let go of everyone else and you've got to do it for yourself but to get there and just for the daily grind then a hundred percent like lean on those people but then like on the big events like for for the for the Ironman for example like oh I I saw people waving at me and things but I guess I was sometimes counting on some friends seeing me like every couple of Ks or something. But after a while, I just went right into my zone and it was like, I had to finish it just because I bloody well had to, like, I really didn't have an answer. I saw people kind of falling over around me and I'm like, "Mm, well, I've just got to keep going. And that's like that, just that deep internal strength. Mm. Yeah. So uh, like, I would say ultimately every single thing that I do comes down to my decision to do it or not yeah. at the very end of the day. Yeah. And if I want it, I will absolutely do it. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like one of those, you know, you put your mind to it, it, it it's, it's going to happen. Right. And yeah. It, and it, it needs to be real. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like, it almost some some uh, similarity like whenever like i decide like you know this is going to happen like it it rolls out right mm. um so like you know let's talk about the iron man like did you mm. like firstly like when was that point where you said yeah i'm going to do this you know like were you a cyclist before were you at, well i mean rpm um were yeah. you a like a swimmer before were you a runner before like when did you decide yep i'm going to do this um and then yeah. talk to me about that journey like you know did you do any practice runs did you run like a like a yeah. half marathon or anything like that and like you know what what led you up to that day and then what was the day like doing the iron man okay so um I started off just doing really little triathlons and it was really funny because 
uh, my coach at the time, who was also like my mentor with spin, she said, you should do triathlons. She just said, oh, you're really good on the indoor bike. So mm. she lent me her husband's bike and off we go on to Beach Road and I actually couldn't get on the bike. I was that scared. And mm-hmm. she didn't realise that that was going to happen to me and neither did I because I wasn't a bike rider. Mm. So we had to get through that hurdle where I had all this fear about hopping on the bike. So I actually had to f- learn how to ride again mm-hmm. before I even could do the 180 Ks of the, the Ironman. Mm-hmm. I, had to, I had to take it right back and learn how to ride again. Swimming, I'd been naturally quite good at and I was lucky that I worked at a, an aquatic centre with an outdoor pool. So I would um, train with one of my friends who was – doing that and we would do a run together before we do about eight or nine k's every morning before my spin class we do my spin then we'd go for a swim so a little bit backwards but mm. we'd get it all done so I, I did quite a lot of training not in a squat or anything but just I, it ended up the hours added up mm-hmm. you know and so but yeah so I had to learn how to ride um, and I did, I did quite a few of the littler triathlons. And, and the reason that I ended up doing the big one was because I, I won a couple of the little ones so I thought oh I'm pretty pretty shit hot at this i thought i'm very good at (laughs) very good at triathlons obviously um not knowing that the bigger distances are like they'll eat you alive but um so i did a half ironman and actually that was what was a challenge that's the same kind of thing it just doesn't have the same brand but that was also in melbourne and that was i felt really good on that so that was a half marathon that was um half the distance of of everything Mm -hmm. and 90k bike um 1.8k swim and the, the beach was like massive and um it was dark at the time and it was just crazy there's a video of it um yeah insane and i so i did that i I did a half marathon with my with my mum as well prior as a training thing because um mum comes to all my spins so she's Mm -hmm. um really active and has always been a runner so we did that together so there were a few different like markers leading up to that big day but to be honest i it was it was a, a bit of a wing and a prayer. It was like I signed up and I'm going to go through with it mm-hmm. and it's just going to happen. And that is what happened. <laughs> so like, uh, it's like a long haul flight. Like you, you go, I'll never do that again. And then a mm. few years later you go, I want to do that again. But um, <laughs> that's probably, that's me now. It's like after the, the bodybuilding I'm going to do, if, if they have it in Melbourne, they're supposed to have the half Ironman at the end of this year. So I'm mm. going to do that. Mm-hmm. um as something like something a bit different because i haven't done it for a while but um yeah uh, i i did train a lot for that it was just it was just that volume and it was also what you really want to do is um you want to make sure that you're comfortable in the open water mm-hmm. so you need to be able to like swimming in a pool is different to swimming in the open water it's, it can mm-hmm. people panic a little bit so you've mm-hmm. got to get your breath you've got yeah. you've got to figure out your wetsuit your breath and then um yeah, with the running, it's just about finding a, a tempo that you can sustain for that amount of time. That's also not going to give you a massive injury because that's mm. what you've got to watch out for with this long stuff is that wear and tear on your body. Yeah. Mm. What was it like with the transition from like the swim to the run? Like did you, or swim to the cycle and the run? Did you yeah. like get changed? Did you dry yourself? Like how, how yeah, does that you, work? You, you have to. Well, in the small ones, you don't. Like in the small ones, you, you don't even, I didn't even wear socks. Like I was taught and trained, you don't wear socks. You just, you're a badass. Uh, you know, that was, you, you just had to be as quick as possible. But in the really big one, they have people that help you. Yeah, like okay. you've got your own person that, that um, you have a bag and they like, they get your bag and they help you and they put your socks on and they put sunscreen on you. And it's like a day out, like for a month, <laughs> you're like, actually, I'm having some time out here. It's like, I'm, I'm going to the do- spa, but I'm going to go run <laughs> a marathon. Yeah. Exactly. All I have to do to earn this time out is just do like this whole big event. But um, like, yeah, the transition, that was really good. Like I commend those people because I, I th- actually think they're volunteers, but they do such a good job. Mm. and so um and they're at all the drink stations and there was one point where I, where I was struggling a little bit at one of the drink stations on the bike and I knew that like if I didn't show that I was a one they'd probably send that sag wagon to get me so I'm like hello I'm really <laughs> I'm good great. <laughs> yeah, I'm great and I thought I, I thought to myself I'm not great but I'm mm. like may I partake of one of your gels please you know and I'm thinking oh god you know and I just thought just don't look at me and so I got through because I thought like they do come and pick you up if mm. you're a bit struggle so yeah. <laughs> yeah that it was looking back it's like oh lord but um yeah. you know 
there's nothing you can't do if you've done that, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the only comparison I had to that is I've run a marathon. Um, yeah. And my story in a, in a very short stint was, I guess I was always a weightlifter. And someone made a snide comment to me being like, oh, you're too big to run, as in like too muscular uh, to run. And I was yeah. never a runner. I was never anything like that. And I was like, you know what? I reckon I could do this. Um, and at the time I had an, an ACL reconstruction surgery and I was studying uh, rehabilitation as, as an osteopath. And I was, I was like, well, yeah, I could rehab myself. So part of my rehab process and to prove this person wrong was um, I started running after my surgery once I got the clearance. And I built myself up to a point where I was able to run a 10K. And I was like, okay, this isn't, this isn't that hard. Like, all right. Then um, on a whim, I signed up to the marathon because I don't do things half ass, right? No. So yeah. I signed up to the marathon and um, I hadn't run a, a long distance. The longest I ran was about 30 kilometers before the actual yeah. marathon events. Um, and then I remember the actual day where uh, I was surprised about how many people that were much more out of shape than I was running the marathon who were much mm. older than I was. Um, mm. And these people were ahead of me, right. Running along. Yeah. Um, and there was definitely those mental moments where, um, you know, I had that self-talk of, I'll just give up. Who are you doing this for? Like, you know, no one's going to know if you quit. Rah, 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 rah. Mm. And I found that like, once I, I, I broke through that wall, it was around that like 30, 35 kilometer mark. I found like this, you know, second or third or fourth wind, or I can't remember how many like little oomphs I got, but it was like this energy that I didn't know I had kind of like mm. came to me. And that last maybe like five kilometers was my fastest five kilometers in the whole marathon itself, where like I was able to find something deeper just to kind of push me through. Yeah. So like, yeah. could you, could you relate a little bit to that? Like that, you know, did you reach that moment in the Ironman where you kind of felt like, oh, you know, I wanted to give up or yeah, it was really hard, oh, it was really yeah. driving, but then maybe like that last little bit, maybe you saw your yeah. family, maybe you saw the finish line, you're like, you got this burst of energy and, you know, you were able to complete it. Like, does that resonate with you? Oh, hundred percent. But also what you said before, and it's so interesting because I was actually thinking about this today, but the mm. thing of where you go, nobody will know if I quit. See, the thing is now, say with us, we're a bit more out there. So if people know what we're going to do, they know it. There's no mm. chance. So there's no more, there's never a safety net anymore for the, the nobody will know unless you just keep everything in your head 24 seven, but you can't anymore. Mm. So that's so interesting because there's no more safety barrier. It's like, you're so vulnerable, but that's, mm. that's actually where you find out what you're really made of. Mm. But and that um, almost drives you now. Cause you're like, well, I can't yeah. give up. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's on those deep moments where you go, well, I might give up, but then now there's just, there's no choice. So, you, and everybody does that. That's the thing. Everybody has a moment where they think that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter um, how successful you are or anything like that. Don't, I don't think anybody should ever think that, that it doesn't matter what you've done every single time. You might have a moment where you give up or even every day you might go, I don't feel like training today. And in a way, that's every time you do that sort of a thing and you don't do it, you are giving up a little bit. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that happens to everyone. But yeah, the, the moment of, of truth for, for me with all, all those things, I always have something where there's always a bit of a dip. And like, especially if there's, if there are three laps of something, hmm. um, the second lap is just hideous. It's always the worst. It's like, you got to go, you know, that it's um, not coming, you know, that there's another lap left, but like, and then the third lap of something or the last little bit of something you can find that energy again and that's yeah. actually a lot like um like childbirth because yeah. what, it's like it's the bit it's a minute where you think that you, you you can't do it anymore and it's very well documented where you go where people go oh, i can't do this anymore that's actually where people are about to you're about to push and it's about it's time so yeah. that's the same as with with us with mar marathons or with anything where you just about go i can't do it and then that reserve kicks in it's like a, a turbo in a car yeah. you know it's some, something if you can break through that little bit and I've gone through it with, with mum, she won't mind me telling, but yeah, when she went, she was doing her half marathon and it was about the 14 K mark. Mm. And even though we'd practiced, we'd done, I'd actually done a good job with this one. I'd practiced, we'd done, but she, she said to me all of a sudden out of the blue, I don't think I can keep doing this. And I'm like, what? And mm. you know, that mum never says that about anything. So I had to help figure out how to mentally get her through you know, to the bit where she got to go to the MCG and, that like 
that that was a great bit and it's great that we got through but everyone goes through and it's like are you going to break through or are you going to stand on the side of the road at one of those things and watch everyone else run by how does it end yeah like how would it actually end like what you'll stand there do you know that like you'd probably still have to walk back anyway? <laughs> like, you have to finish where it. Where does it end? Yeah. Because you could start to walk a little bit, but you'd still, the idea is like it, you've still got to finish it because no one's coming to pick you up. Even your family can't get through in a car on those things. No. So where you once you you're do? in, you're, you're in, it's like a water slide. You just got yeah. to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very much like, um, you know, I was just thinking while you're talking, uh, you know, of David Goggins, where he says that um, when your mind wants to give up, you're only 40% done. There's always that reserve. Yeah. So when you do want to throw in the towel, when you do want to yeah. stop doing something like th- there is so much more and, you know, making that analogy back to the challenge, right? You know, there's so many times where people want to throw in the towel and there's that dip, there's that dip, you know, that's we see it all the time. Maybe that week six, week eight mark, we're two thirds yeah. of the way through the challenge. We're on, you know, rep two of rep three or, or we're on lap two of lap three, right? Yeah. It's That's when people want to throw in the that's towel. Right. You know, mentally we want yeah. to give up, but there's so much, so much more. And, you know, making more analogies about what you said, like now we're, we're a little bit more public than what we were, where in the past we were quite private. And in the challenge, we have those two options. You can sign up to the challenge privately and not post any photos, or mm-hmm. you could sign up to the challenge very publicly. You could make social media accounts. You could post on our Facebook group. You could tell the world that you're doing this challenge, that you're yeah. going to lose weight. And if you make that public announcement, guess what? <laughs> you're going to lose that weight, right? Um, you know, yeah. you, there's no backing down. There's, there's, there's no way you're going to stop if you make that that public announcement and that's right yeah and, and people are there for you that's the thing like a lot of people will go oh i don't like this was used to be me i don't want to make it public because nobody needs to know I, who no. would want to know about me but it's like no. if you you don't know how many people you're actually helping and within your own network you don't know how many people you might be inspiring to go i saw you do that i decided to go for a walk today mm. and that like sometimes people will tell me that and it's like i did not even know did not even know that that was something. So it's like, it's almost like once you start to do this and you see it in the challenge in the, in the Facebook group, you know, the, the people that have, have done it before and now with the mentors as well, it's like you take it on to help other people. It's paying it forward. That's my yeah. favorite bit about fitness, I think. And, you know, people that have done the lap two and then gone into the lap three and like smashed it, they're the ones that go, look, that's the bit. This is that bit that we've got to yeah. help you through with. This is where you have that extra, extra drink, you know, your extra drink of water and you take a deep breath and you look around and you see who's helping you and you push forward. Yeah. You know? I love that. Well, you, you know, let's, backwards. let's talk about, you know, from, from that Ironman that you did, you kind of slowly transitioned into powerlifting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Can you think of maybe any lessons you learned while you were doing endurance events like maybe those mm. mental lessons. And then did you find that you applied them to powerlifting? Like maybe um, that that idea of lap two of lap three and then maybe, you know, rep yeah. two of rep three or maybe that, that fear aspect, like, you know, swimming in open water or hopping on the bike can be fearful. Same yeah. as when you're staring at like your, your PB on the platform, like that 150 sharp end that you were talking about with the deadlift. Exactly. Like, did you yeah. learn any things from um, endurance events and then applied it to another fitness thing such as powerlifting like can you speak a bit about that yeah for sure well I was lucky because um, everybody thought um, at the particular gym that I was training at at the time they're like you've done an Ironman you're a badass so then they would go oh my god you can lift that much weight you're a badass so I just started to believe I was a badass it's like well yeah yeah." and then also what was really good, like in an actual practical thing was all of the endurance that I'd done had actually banked up to be a really good threshold to then Mm. be able to lift weights and recover quite quickly. So I found that, and I still find that that's what I take from all the cardio that I do. Mm. Um, I manage it by, you know, managing my nutrition, making sure that I'm taking in enough, but Mm. I find that recovery is good because I'm actually like a fit person Mm. so that i took that with me to powerlifting but also the thing is i I also took the i mean i'm 10 times more scared of getting on a bike i'm happier to get on it if the roads are closed and you know no one's watching me and like but i i i don't love it Mm. like if people from my spin class want to go for a group ride it'll take me a bit to psych myself up Mm. to do it i like it when i'm doing it but it's not my my absolute favorite so i would wait put put 
put you know put 120 kilos on my back or something like that and and make me do it um you know i prefer to do that without catches Mm -hmm. than and i don't recommend that but i do not recommend it but i'm just saying like if you know how to get rid of the butt i prefer to do that than ride a big distance because like weights i can understand i can Mm -hmm. kind of understand they they make you they break you um it's it's kind of it's for me it's a lot of fun and it's very thrilling Mm -hmm. and it's um something i really understand so i still even though i've I've done endurance i still sometimes don't understand it Mm -hmm. i'm going like i still go why why do we want to do that like it's it's really hard (laughs) and it takes ages and you know why can't why shouldn't i just go into the gym for one or two hours and just do those other fun things and they're so cool and so rewarding and i love all the people around me and Mm -hmm. so um i still question but um, so into powerlifting, powerlifting was a great time. It was mm. a great time because I got to find out also about food and mm. about um, how good it can be for you and how you've got to eat to fuel your body. And that was probably for the, that was the first time as, as a woman that I kind of went, oh my gosh, this is, yeah, I'm starving and I'm going to honour mm. that because I've lifted these weights and I want to grow and I want to be, want to be huge and muscular. That's what I wanted, you know? Yeah, so yeah. that was, that was time of my life. And I'm so glad I had that time because um, it grew me uh, like obviously mentally, but also physically into mm-hmm. something that then could, could transition into bodybuilding quite comfortably and like holding a, a, a very decent amount of muscle, that mm-hmm. sort of thing that maybe wasn't sculpted in the correct way, but it was all there. You know, yeah. and so that that's um, I would never trade that. And if just say someone said to me, you could go back to one point in your life of your training, I'd probably go back in to that in terms of just the, the way it made me feel, how empowering it was to walk up to that that deadlift bar and be able to lift it and put, put that chalk on and even get you know the, the cuts in your hands and other things. That, I never wore, I never wore belts, never wore anything. I loved the feeling of everything. So mm-hmm. um, that's, that's my jam. I yeah. would say. Yeah. I might die being doing that. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think I can relate. I guess I've never, I've yeah. never competed formally in a, um, like a powerlifting meet. Um, mm-hmm. But I guess I've dabbled with people who, and trained with people who lift in, in, um, in powerlifting competitions and mm. there's something so rewarding and so uh, I guess you, you feel like like Superman I guess when you've got like yeah. twice your body weight on your back or you're trying to pick yeah. up like you know close to three times your body weight and you're like yeah. yes I'm like a machine like exactly. I am an engine you know it's, uh, it's undeniable it's undeniable yeah. and the community around you as well everybody yeah. so supportive of of that kind of stuff and um you know strong women Mm -hmm. and that kind of that that kind of community it's amazing to see you know it's it's a it's a different not not that the bodybuilding community is not supportive it's just it's a different vibe because once you start getting into the bodybuilding one everybody naturally is is highly competitive in that one yeah yeah gonna be supportive but they're also going to be in their own zone yeah. going i'm going to be the best i'm going to be the best whereas with powerlifting it's like ah what are you up to do you want to lift stuff you know <laughs> i love that so that's just great like yeah. I, I love that and i loved um training at, at um at the gym that i was at at the time where like there was a leaderboard so it was fun to try and get on that leaderboard and that sort of stuff like that's very motivating um weights wise because it's like if you can lift really heavy weights nobody can you just feel untouchable you know so that's that's really good and also heavy heavy if that's the thing it doesn't have to necessarily be those massive numbers it can be whatever pushes you yeah you know that's the thing it doesn't have to be it's like even on the bike we i deal with watts you know power to weight with watts data you would um, you would love it actually with your with the data <laughs> it's very datary so um you know and there's a place for everyone yeah. in that spectrum and that's what i love as well about the gym and about mm. that environment it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter where you've come from there's a place for you there and there's yeah. really no judgment which is so refreshing yeah 
Yeah, I think I think there's a, a, often a a fear or maybe a barrier where people feel like they are going to get judged when they go to a gym. Mm. Um, mm. But like you said, you know, everyone, you know, there's a, there's a place for you everywhere, and you'll find that in the most competitive environments, they are also the most supportive environments, and you know, the most like biggest communities, right? Definitely. And you know, you would have seen it in powerlifting, you would have seen it in the Ironman, and you would have seen it when you were competing as well. Like mm. when you reach that com- like competition level, like some people think it's you know very isolating um same as the gym some people think it's very isolating but it is this this big um community of people that are ultimately supportive right and you know let's say in a powerlifting meet um sure there's you know there's going to be a winner there's one person that you know lifts the most but you know everybody is celebrated because you are you know reaching your potential at that time so it doesn't matter if you're lifting 50 kilos 100 kilos 300 kilos like no one really cares the number it's all about the effort that is rewarded it's like you tried pushing to your potential on that day in that moment in time and that is what is to be celebrated right Mostly, mostly, honestly, you hear the absolute screams and cheers for mm. the people that you know are brand new to it and are lifting, um, you know, their absolute max. That it doesn't really matter if it's a super light weight. You just you see it and you you see everybody going around and screaming and filming yeah. it, and it, it's yeah. it's a wonderful thing. Mm. Like it's where else do you get this kind of like positive affirmation, like you know, positive like reinforcement, I guess. Um, other than at, at the gym and also like in the environment that we work in we're lucky because like every day I get someone going oh my god you're amazing oh my god you know I, I'm sure that a lot of people at work don't get that you know they don't get they don't get that feedback every day that I'm 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 very fortunate to have that and so for me the gym and the gym environment if if you ever think that it it doesn't feel right like the good thing about gyms is that there's millions of them so wait until you find one that feels right for you. And it doesn't mean you have to chat to everyone. That's like if you're someone who is quiet and introverted and stuff, that's okay as well. You just got to pick one where you, where you feel fits you, you know, and then you'll start to feel all the things that I'm trying to explain, yeah. you know, that yeah. sense of community, that sense of home. It's just yeah. that sometimes you can have the wrong gym. You know, I've worked at the wrong ones where you go, oh, the vibe isn't right here and that's okay because there's so many yeah you know you're you get to choose i'm a i'm a sucker for for gyms even though at the moment i'm training in my garage but um i feel like sometimes my partner feels really embarrassed when she goes to the gym with me because i just start talking to the reception i start talking to the the cleaner that's there i'm talking to the pts that are around there's a guy that i say hi to every day don't know his name but hey man what's up like yeah what are you training yeah cool yeah awesome like yeah Yeah. you start making friends it's like hey bro can you spot me like you know those types of things and i I feel like all these people i don't know their names but like i know their faces i feel like i talk Mm. to them every day um Mm. and it's it's just an an awesome feeling because i think sometimes as an adult it's hard to find that community again right you know it's hard to find that friendship group or you know meet people sometimes it's, it can be challenging and even if you are the most outgoing charismatic mm. person sometimes you're just never in that environment and mm. sometimes you know your closest friends are just people you work with because of Definitely. the uh, uh proximity location right um uh, yeah, but exactly. to find a place where you can leave home go to a gym and chat with people is 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 cool but you know that can take time as well because you know sometimes there is just that 24-hour gym that's never staffed Mm. and you you you, you're maybe a little bit time poor you go in for your half an hour workout and you need to run off to work um but then other times you go to group fitness classes you meet people like yourself Mm. and you chat with the person Mm. on next to you on your bike and you're in it together right you're like yeah let's finish this together and that's Um, awesome and yeah you can go oh my god what's this instructor doing it's killing mm, me you know yeah yeah. it's it's killing us it's killing us you know yeah yeah (laughs) It's a, it's a lot of, a lot of fun um, mm. to do that sort of stuff, like to, you know, get that kind of community, but that's, that's what I'm sort of noticing in um, the Facebook group, just, just getting started, you know, with, with the challenge, you can see that it's such a community, you know, if mm. someone puts a question up, there's, there's really 10 people straight away answering that question. So that's, it's such a positive environment to even, you know, to begin your journey for the first time that it's sort of replicating what I had, but like in a virtual form, which is where we live mm. these days anyway. So um, it's so nice. It's really nice to have that. And it feels like very um, welcoming. And um, that that's a good thing because yeah. um, 
you know, it's, a, it's nice to have a little safe hub where you can go. And, and look, even when I was just introducing myself, I was like, oh, gosh, it felt like going to a new a new gym or a new party or something and going, oh, well, you know, here I am. But everyone mm. was just so welcoming. So you've just got to take that first step. So even me, I was like, oh, do I post this? I look a bit sweaty. I've just done my spin class. It's like, no, nah, just get out there. Just put yeah. it out there. So that's, that's, I think, what you've got to do, that first step. And then it's like creating content. It's like, it's like doing a marathon. It's like it's one step after another and suddenly it all builds. Yeah. You know, you just got to keep going and you got to have that dedication every day. You don't have to have motivation, but just dedication to it to keep going. Because the motivation thing, like all that, that sort of thing where everybody sort of goes, um, you know, I, I don't feel motivated today. It's like, oh gosh, I wonder, I reckon probably 50% of the time I'm not, not necessarily motivated. It's mm. just, I will do it and then I will find something within it that will make me keep going that day. Yeah. yeah. Motivation is the, the biggest lie that's going around. Um, I reckon. Yeah. 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 I think, I think for, for me, I often, often um, make little lies to myself. So I'd say things like, oh, I'll just, um, you know, go for a run around the block, but I'll end up doing like a, a longer run or yeah. I'll just go in and do one set of squats and I'll end up doing like three or four and then I'll do the rest of my legs workout. So, um, and then yeah. I do that with life, you know, when I'm writing content, like I dislike writing. I'm not a great writer. I'm a better speaker, better with audio, but writing is not my, my skill set. So when I do go to write, I would say something like, oh, I'm just going to write like, you know, 200 words and that's it. Um, yeah. Or I'm just going to go do one dish in the sink and I end up doing the whole dishes and clean the whole house. Right. So yeah. I often lie to myself a lot <laughs> to get things done, but it, it kind of, it, 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 it helps me with that, you know, daily grind that daily dedication where when I don't want to do it because the weather's crappy I still go out and do it and I think that's yeah. what you kind of learn over time when in the in, in the gym when you don't yeah. want to do it when you don't want to go for that swim when you don't want to go, it's you know it's five o'clock in the morning I don't want to teach that spin class yeah. like, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna go do this thing right I know like the amount of times that I, I'm, I'm like I could say oh um zoom isn't working today and every single time I thought to say that I thought imagine those beautiful people that are waiting for me and they've gotten out of bed and they've managed to do it and what I can't manage to do it, you know, like, and then I turn the computer on and there, there's like 15 people. And I think, Oh gosh, yeah. thank God I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but every single person, you know, has that, everyone goes through that. And I guess the champion mindset, that kind of mindset that you want to cultivate is someone that, that will be able to find strategies to push through that. Mm -hmm. So it's not, somebody that it never happens to especially with what's gone on in the last like year or so it happens to everyone everyone mm. goes through this at the moment going what is going on so um it's how do we push through this and sometimes you have to be a bit selfish and go okay i'm going to take an hour right now i'm going to leave everything and then i'm going to come back to it later and i'm just going to do what i need to do to get myself sorted out mm. so it's like I, when i used to write essays all the time i would I never wanted to do it. So I would always do my research first and write all the footnotes out and have it all there and then sit, probably sit that there for like a week. And then I'd fill in everything around it. But it was like, I've done the footnotes. I've done the research. I, I've done that. So that's exactly the same way as I approach everything else. It's like little bits at a time. And for me, it doesn't have to be in order as mm. long as I bloody well do it. Mm. You know, and that's yeah. what I think has, has helped me to get to where I am now, which is a good spot. Yeah. 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 Well, like, you know, if you consider uh, every aspect of fitness, right, it's all about the combination of little bits and pieces, right? Like yeah. you can't expect to start a fitness program and be the world's best squatter, be the, you know, the most cardiovascular person going around or have the biggest biceps or the biggest glutes or whatever like that. You can't expect to mm. be perfect straight away, right? It's all about those yeah. little bits and pieces along the way. And you might have yeah. something that kind of looks like fitness, but then yeah. as you develop over time, you go, okay, well, I can make this a bit better. I can, you know, get yeah. better here, get better there. And then even, you know, you and I with, you know, decades of experience, we're still finding ways to challenge our body oh. and learn different yeah. things and being like, oh, Definitely. you know, what if I did this? What if I tried that? What if I read this? Oh, wow, this person's mm -hmm. interesting to follow. I like their philosophy mm -hmm. and all these bits and pieces. Um, so I guess, Always I guess my like final kind of question here before we wrap it up is, you know, looking into the future, um, you know, you've kind of spoken a little bit about bodybuilding um, mm. and you've got a bit of a show coming up. 
in the future. Yes. Um, can you mm -hmm. speak a little bit about your, I guess, future goals or maybe some things that you might be interested in at the moment or learning at the moment through your own training or through your own reading or your own interests at, at the moment? Yep. So um, I am very focused for the April 24th show that's in Melbourne because that's the Miss Fitness Australia and that's coming down from Queensland for the first time in Melbourne. So um, that's very good of them to bring it here because we weren't able to travel to compete um, and it was sad to see the show go on without the Victorians. So um, I'm definitely doing that show and I'll do the AMB and the IMBA as well. And um, so that's in, in May. So um, that's kind of, co yeah, like I said before, it sort of co coincides, the, the, the April one coincides with almost the end of the challenge. So that's going to be a bit of fun to, you know, use to um, kind of all motivate each other in a way. Mm. Um, so, yeah, my goals are to, to, do really well in those in those shows um i've because i've accidentally had a year off um mm. because yeah nothing happened here so i have had a good year of of growth and development so um mm. i should be able to produce something fairly good you know which i'm only comparing it to my previous self because mm. that's all i can do so i already know that I've beaten that person that was standing up there, but there's, there were other things that I needed to do, which I'm still working on, which is, you know, refining presentation and posing and stuff. So um, that's, that's something that I'm really working on as well. Um, you know, business wise, I'm heading in the right direction. I, um, so my very big thing is to make sure that I um, spend a lot of time, even though I'm going to be on social media a lot and I still am right like all the time, I need to also read proper books as well. So that's one of my goals, just to, to sit there and read the books and switch off and um, read and touch books and, and spend time doing that and spend time with my girls and, and be well-rounded because I feel like the fitness and the nutrition side is under control. So mm -hmm. it's like the sleep, the self-care side of it, needs needs to make sure that that all fits in as well and that i'm not rushing around like a headless chook yeah because um because yeah. this this um next step in my career will actually allow me to to you know have a voice in a really good way and i can relax a little bit too in terms of mm. that because because once i start producing and um you know engaging that that'll just be amazing so that that's this year so that's and then, of course, I've got the half Ironman at the end of the year, so that I'll end with something completely different. But first, it's about <laughs> it's about retaining as much muscle as possible. So I've got to make yeah. sure I, you know, just stay on top of all of that. But mm. um, they're just mini goals, and um, you know, I still I'm always chasing the the best numbers I can in the gym. But I have you have to let that go when you're doing bodybuilding. You have to go. It's not about strength. It's about the way you look. Yeah, but yeah. for me, it's not, yeah, not always just about, it's not looks, it's just about creating something. And it's just, mm. it's just happens to be you. So, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So uh, what are you, what are you reading at the moment? Oh, uh, I just, I like to read a lot of fiction stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, but my husband just, uh, he just showed me two books that I um, ordered. So one is Girl on Fire. So I'm going to try that one. And um, I think that's going to be really good. Mm -hmm. So I like to read a lot of ones um, about just just women finding their voice unapolog uh, unapologetically. So mm -hmm. I like Brene Brown. I like yeah. I like to um, I like to read about also yeah, about how you, books like that. Yeah, 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 she's really good. I like to read mm -hmm. about how you can be vulnerable and authentic, you mm -hmm. know, and that and people actually resonate with your authenticity. So mm -hmm. you don't have to hide who you are. You can actually be vulnerable and say like i've had a shit day today mm. you know I, I was like nice and vulnerable in this interview where i said look i'm not always freaking perfect and mm. that's hard for a, for a type a person like somebody who wants to you know lead and and be so good at everything to say no i have really crappy days mm. you know i'm already kind of practicing what's in those books which is just be authentic in your vulnerability mm. you know that's what you've got to do people have to share that a little bit more with each other because Everyone goes through it. And if you fake it and pretend that you're all over it every day, people will never be able to measure up to something like that because it actually mm. doesn't exist. Yeah. 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 Mm. I love that. Look, Nick, yeah. um, let's wrap it up there. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you and I'm sure yeah, we'll be um, having lots of, lots of chats similar to this um, moving forward. Thank you. Thank awesome. you, Steve. That was really good. Thank you. See you guys. See you.